So thank you so much for coming. Um, we're going to spend the next 20 minutes focused on exactly what we're doing with Docker on vSphere. Um, and the denouement of the whole thing is going to be installing Docker Data Center on vSphere, but self-provisioning. So let's move swiftly onwards. Now, if you were at DockerCon uh, a year ago, two years ago, you may have gone to some presentations or seen some talks that are like containers versus VMs, which is better, right? And, and to some extent, you know, the conversation has really moved on from that. I think people have realized that the, the containers and VMs are fundamentally complementary technologies. And that's what we've always believed at VMware, right? VMs are um, excellent tenant domains. They're naturally failure domains. Um, you know, they're isolation domains. They work great like that. And of course, for all of our customers, they allow them to virtualize anything, right? They can have their Windows desktops and their analytics workloads and, and everything virtualized in this great big pool of resource. And they want their container workloads to be just another workload, right? That integrates with all these other things uh, that's on their system. So what we've been doing at VMware really is we've been blurring the lines between containers and VMs and trying to integrate these things to make the experience better for our customers um, and all in open source, which I'm very proud of. So what we're going to do in this slide is look at the features and the products that we're building that integrate Docker with vSphere at the moment. And the first one that we're going to look at very briefly is vSphere Integrated Containers Engine, or Vic Engine. Now that's close to our hearts because that's what I work on. It's what Ivan works on. Put very simply, Vic Engine is a Docker engine for vSphere. It's as simple as that. Well, Ben, what does that mean? Well, what it means is I can control vSphere from a Docker client. What it means is if I type Docker Network LS, I see vSphere networks. If I type Docker Volume Create, I create a disk on a vSphere data store. And if I type Docker Run, I get a VM, right? And we're going to see exactly how that works in the demo. But as part of the Vic product, we also have uh, other features. We have Harbor, which is a registry. And it's really important that we have a registry because Docker images are becoming more and more and more important. More and more things are being shipped as Docker images. Uh, with Vic Engine, we can now spin up VMs using Docker images in addition to containers. And we can spin up VMs and containers using the exact same images. Um, there's a lot of innovation going on right now in the area of security around images. So people really like Docker images. Harbor's super important for that reason. Uh, Admiral ties everything together. It's a UI, and in the UI, you get to see your registries and your repositories that you're allowed to access. You get to see the endpoints you're allowed to provision to, and you can pick images and provision them as containers or as applications uh, into those endpoints. Uh, we have been working kind of secretly on integration with NSX. So Ivan here has been slaving away for the last few weeks, um, creating a lib network plugin for NSX, which is our software-defined networking solution in vSphere. This is super cool because what it means is from a regular Docker client, you can connect Docker containers to NSX networks. You can even create NSX networks using Docker Network Create. You're going to see that in the demo. With storage, we're doing a similar thing. So we have this Docker volume plugin that allows you to connect uh, disks in vSphere directly to Docker containers and mount them in the containers. And the beauty of this is that if you have shared storage like vSAN, or iSCSI, NFS, basically you create a volume in that shared storage and your container can see that persistent data anywhere that it gets migrated to because it's on a vSphere data store. So that's super cool too. Um, finally, we have been looking at Linux, Kit, and Mobi the last uh, few months. We don't have anything to show yet, but we are looking at that. We think that's cool. Um, Container D, though, we are getting really involved in. Um, Container D, um, particularly for Vic Engine and for the things that Vic Engine is deploying, we really feel like Container D uh, is a step in the right direction. And we have a full time uh, contributor to Container D. So, what ties all these things together? Well, fundamentally, it's bringing the best of Docker to vSphere and bringing the best of vSphere to Docker, right? Bringing the best of Docker to vSphere because we're taking the Docker model, the Docker workflow, the Docker grammar, the Docker image format, and making that work directly with vSphere with Vic Engine, and the best of vSphere to Docker in that we're taking all these great vSphere infrastructure pieces, the networking, the storage, and allowing you to connect those directly to, uh, to a Docker container. So why are we doing this? I mean, that's actually a pretty good question because we could very easily say to our customers, guys, it's just another workload. It's just containers. Just virtualize it. You know, I mean, it's just another workload. But the thing is, a lot of our customers really want to get into containers. In fact, a lot of our customers are really interested in containerizing their existing workloads, which may come as a surprise, but they are. 
And when they're approaching that, they're looking at it and saying, well, okay, we like the ephemerality of containers and we like the workflow, we like the images, we like the dynamic nature of everything, but we trust vSphere currently to run our enterprise workloads. Can we somehow kind of have all of those things combined? And that's exactly what we're doing, right? We're combining that operational efficiency with the enterprise robustness of the vSphere backend through the technologies that you've seen. The way that I like to see it, or the way I like to describe it, is, is fundamentally policy as plumbing, right? You tell us what your workload needs, and we go away and we pick the right plumbing to meet that need. The interesting side effect of this is that by putting a Docker API into vSphere, we're actually also starting to change the relationship between the admin and the user, and this is pretty exciting. So I'm just gonna do a little role play with Ivan right now. You're gonna have to suspend disbelief. He is a vSphere admin, and I'm a developer. Right? Trust me, this, this, is, this is how we're going with this, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna, you know what, I, I, I need a VM, okay? I raised a ticket a week ago, and I, this is just ridiculous. I don't know what you do in your little hole, wherever it is you live. Um, you know, I've got friends that work at startups, and they just get infrastructure on demand. Why, why is this so hard for me? And by the way, I said I wanted an 8-gig VM, now I want a 16-gig VM, because I don't wanna have to go through this again, right? So, so Get with the times, buddy. Like, have you not heard of Docker? Seriously. Uh, we just don't, we don't always play docs in our basement, right? So we also <laughs> learn about Docker. Um, what is it that you need? Well, that's a good question. What is it that I need? Well, you know, what I actually just want is access to some infrastructure. That's what I need. I mean, sure, it could be a VM. And, you know, a VM's fine. But actually, if I could just have access to infrastructure where I could create my own VMs, that would be so much cooler. And, you know, some networking and some storage, of course, I'm going to need that. So yeah, I want to be able to stand up Docker hosts, I want to be able to stand up Jenkins, I want to be able to automate everything, uh, I just want to be able to do what I want to do, and by the way, I want you to worry about backups, and I want you to worry about network security, and downtime, and, um, and auditing, and all that you stuff, I want you to think and worry about that. Is, is, it, does it, is that a deal? Can we do that? Sure, as long as I can put the resource limits for you, and I can get you, uh, I can get insight into what you're doing, and I can, um, I don't have to hand you over my credentials, I'm good. Okay, so you don't want to give me your credentials, you want to put limits around what I do and you want to see what I do. Yeah. That seems reasonable. So moving back out of the role play, let's see what that actually um, translates to in practice. So we're gonna go straight into a shell, the right shell, and what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna show you some a simple JSON config. Uh, so if we go to uh, here, uh, am I in the right place here? It would help if I was in the right place, wouldn't it? Okay, let's try more VCH2 uh, config.json. Okay, here's some config. Now this config describes uh, exactly what Ivan was talking about. Some compute, some networking, some storage. This is all vSphere networking, vSphere storage, and some vSphere credentials. And this manifest basically allows us to just use Docker to actually stand up a Docker engine in vSphere using those, uh, those, those settings. And what that's gonna do, <laughs> if you can see, uh, what that's gonna do is it's gonna present the user with sim two things, a host and some keys to connect to this Docker endpoint. So this is already worked out. So if I do, let's see, if I do export, uh, is that gonna work? There we go. So now I've basically set up the Docker client so I can type docker info. Okay, so I'm connected to vSphere integrated containers in vSphere. The admin has set this up for me. I don't have any vSphere credentials, but now within the bounds of what he set up, I can now self-provision just about anything. So if I do docker network network ls, for example, I see a vSphere network, the vSphere network that he's allocated to me that I can provision containers on. If I do docker volume create, and that's just created a disk in a data store, and I can mount that disk to containers. If I do docker run dash it uh, Debian, what's that gonna do? Well, it's gonna go away to Docker Hub, it's gonna pull down the Debian image, it's gonna extract it out to the data store that the admin said was gonna be the data store for images. Um, none of this is in Linux, this is all in vSphere. And then it's gonna mount that image to a VM, which is booting right now, and now I'm in a VM. I'm in a brand new VM running Debian. So. What can I do with this VM? Well, it's actually really interesting. If you type ps-ef, you'll see I'm not actually in a container. I'm not in a process namespace. I am in a VM running Debian. And the moment I type exit, the VM powers off because the container's finished. 
uh, Docker PS-A will show me the VMs that are stopped, that are running, that, are, that, are, that, are, that I'm using. But these VMs look and smell and feel and operate exactly like containers, but as a user, I can self-provision these things into vSphere. So I'm gonna show you uh, a slightly more powerful uh, version of this where I'm gonna just find my command line. So what this is doing now, remember I used Docker to install the control plane, I'm now using Docker to install Docker data center into the control plane, right? Now if you want, I'll show you the, 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 the GitHub red, uh, repo with all of the details of how I did this at the end, um, but it's very simple. I've just mapped in my credentials uh, as the, the, the certificates. I've mapped in uh, some more JSON that I didn't show you, I'm sorry, that defines the shape of the cluster, how many nodes, how big are the nodes, all this kind of stuff, and it's setting up Docker data center for me. Now, we don't have time to wait for that, so I'm gonna switch over to Ivan, who is gonna show you what you can do with Docker Data Center once it's actually up and running. So Ivan, why don't you take over uh, the presentation for a minute? Yeah. So I fast forwarded earlier and I deployed a Docker Data Center. I've got a, um, a V container engine, a uh, container host, I've got a manager, I've got three worker nodes. This uh, particular vCenter deployment um, is also loaded with NSX uh, T. And um, how do I go? Where do you wanna go? Okay. Oh, you wanna go back to that, yeah. yeah. And uh, if I enter my master, which I've done here, and um, we also installed our plugins. So we have uh, vSphere, the vSphere volume plugin, and we have the NSX network plugin that is deployed in those uh, Vic deployed VMs. So these are plugins to regular Docker, right? This is a standard Docker engine with the vSphere plugins in it. So if I then uh, go uh, create a volume, it's gonna create a volume with a default size. And I, oh. Yeah, call on, yeah. <laughs> uh, if I started a container with this, then I can create a file. And now I'm switching to uh, my third worker. If I listen, if I listen to the volumes, I see the my volume now, which is from uh, through that plugin. So this is on a shared data store, isn't it? This is on a shared data store. Yeah, it's backed by an NFS data store. <laughs> you ever had a bash history? Yeah, <laughs> bash. It's not my thing. And if I now go and uh, this, this file should exist and it should say hello DockerCon, which it did. So uh, the next part of what I want to show um, is around um, <clears throat> NSX integration. So I also created a, a network earlier. Um, it's called PingPongNet and it uses our NSX driver which in NSX then represents, is represented as a switch where um, we attach some metadata. So we can, we can see uh, which network it belongs to that it's created through Docker and what its subnet is. So we're seeing this in the NSX control plane. Yep. Okay. This is the NSX control plane. Um, and I created three services earlier, uh, ping pong one, ping pong two, and ping pong three. I'm gonna use them to ping pong. Um, and um, uh, one of them is running on my master. So I've got, uh, I've got um, this, this one container running here. So these containers that are deployed, they are represented as actual ports in our NSXT um, control plane. So here I can see that this is a container interface it tells me which, contain, which VM it's attached to, and if I look closer on, into the details, I see again some, some metadata, and more importantly, I see an IP address. So this one has 10.0.0.5, and the one that I've got, uh, let's see. Um, 
uh, and this one has uh, 10007. So from here, I should be able to ping 10005. And I'm just gonna let that go, right? Because there are other things that we can do. By default, we mimic the same behavior as uh, Docker Swarm networks do. So um, that means that every network is completely isolated, but we can go further. We can either blur these boundaries and make networks be able to talk to each other, or what I'm gonna show here is I can say, oh, I don't want this one container in this one network to be able to talk to the other container, so a lot more granular. If I do that and I save these rules and I switch back, then we can now see that the network no longer allows traffic between those, uh, those two containers. It's a very granular firewall ruling. Yeah. And so I can go back and, and allow this again and then everything should get happy again. So all of this is in control of the admin. Uh, the developer can define what he wants, but the admin still has controls to to get a more uh, granular approach going. And I think that's all for my V-Motion? V-Motion, yeah. <laughs> Please show us V-Motion, Ivan. Okay, yes. Uh, so we can also um, take, for example, the manager VM. I started pinging again. And um, the screen is too small. Oh, the screen is too small. <laughs> wow. I don't know. You know what? We can change that. We can change that. Um, let's just uh, quickly change that. System preferences. Oh, we can burn 30 seconds doing this. It's going to be worth it. Displays, 1020p, and you should have, this is going to, this is a proper live demo, isn't it? We, don't, we didn't have any horns to rub for this. OK, there you go. <laughs> OK, let's go next. And now I'm going to pick. Uh, so you're live migrating the master right now? Is yeah, I'm live doing? migrating the master okay. who's currently pinging and who's hosted at uh, 69.93. Is it still pinging or did you stop it? I, I started it. Okay. Yeah. So um, next, I'm going to move it to um, 90.98. Next, next. Yes, do this now, please. And so we see that it's doing stuff here. It's relocating the VM. In meantime, this ping is happily continuing, right? So there will be no loss of connection. The admin can still do all the host maintenance that he wants, but uh, the, the developer wouldn't be aware that the host and the need failed. This app is still very much alive. Right? So to be clear, Ivan, this is a ping running in the thing you're currently live migrating? Yes, this okay. is a ping running in a container in the thing I'm currently live migrating, pinging cool. some other thing that is on another host. Cool, yeah. thank you. All right, let's switch back to the... Uh... Let's switch back to the presentation. We have a couple more minutes, and I just want to uh, finish up uh, with a quick summary. Uh, let's play from here. OK. All right. So what have we just seen? Uh, well, we've just seen um, some experimental work we've been doing for a while uh, to, get, uh, to basically get Docker Data Center deployed on vSphere using uh, Vic, Vic Engine. Um, tying together all of the capabilities that I talked about earlier on. The Docker volume driver, the NSX network driver, uh, the Vic engine, all these pieces tied together to deliver something that's actually really compelling and has a lot of value. The self-service provisioning piece that we looked at is, is we, we really believe will hopefully change the relationship between how people consume vSphere infrastructure because it's incredibly flexible. The, the, the Docker way of working is such a wonderful way of working and to bring that to vSphere has been a real, a real bonus. And the one thing that we weren't able to look at because we didn't have time for was high availability. If we pulled a plug on one of the ESX nodes uh, that, 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 that the Swarm cluster was running on, um, the Swarm nodes would have got recreated on another ESX nodes and rejoined the cluster. Okay, I mean, we should, if we had a longer demo, we'd be able to demonstrate that. Um, but again, vSphere high availability is a really big reason why people trust, uh, trust vSphere to run uh, enterprise workloads in. So the thing I'll end with um, is to say that we have two sessions running tomorrow where we're going to do a deeper dive on this stuff. Now, they're limited sessions. If you want to sign up to come to them, uh, come visit the VMware booth. Um, if you want to uh, hear more about like, the latest stuff from Vic, you could follow me on Twitter. Um, my GitHub has uh, scripts and the Docker files and all of the information about the demo that you just saw. Uh, so you can go and check that out there. Um, but to summarize, what we just saw was us bringing the best of Docker to vSphere and the best of vSphere to Docker. And that's what we're going to continue to do. We love Docker, 
And uh, we're really excited for all the announcements uh, this morning. And uh, thanks for your time. My name is Gary Forgetti. I'm uh, with the Docker business development team. I'm a technical alliance engineer. Um, uh, today's topic is going to be uh, simplify container orchestration with a turbocharged Docker Compose. And, and today's uh, speaker is uh, Casey Bison. Hello! <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's the afternoon. I got to be loud. You are going to be a great audience, um, and this is going to be a fantastic show, but we're going to blaze through it in 20 minutes. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here, even though uh, I couldn't fit the full title on that previous slide. So uh, we're going to talk about, uh, let's see, it's going to be uh, simplifying and turbocharging, simplifying container orchestration, turbocharging Docker Compose. And, um, and, and I love that people are still coming in. Um, I want to ask a question, though. Uh, how many people are using Docker Compose uh, right now? Everybody. Now, how many people are using it in production? Smaller. Is that because uh, fewer people are using Docker in production, or is it just people are moving that way? Or, or have you, what, what's, what's the story there? I'm going to bet that, uh, that a lot of people are, are heading that way uh, one way or another, and this is going to be a really exciting show. Um, how many people are using Docker Swarm? OK, so what that means is a lot of people are using Docker Compose, but you're still using it on one host. Everything I'm going to be talking about here is in the context of doing Docker Compose on multiple hosts, on a swarm or uh, you know across multiple hosts. Now, uh, I think, especially in the time we have, this is an audience that's going to do a whole lot better with a demo rather than slides, because we can go through slides. I mean, I can show, but we can do a demo. Who wants a demo? All right, this is awesome. I'm excited uh, to be here. And bam, there we are. Alrighty, so uh, what I want you to know is that I've already, is that, uh, is that mostly visible? Awesome, awesome. So I've already gone through the process of starting, uh, starting a, a Docker Compose project. Uh, you can guess here that I'm actually running MySQL. How many people are running databases in Docker right now? This is awesome. Um, now, how many people, uh, how many people think Actually, running databases in Docker is the smartest and best thing ever. It's, it can be tough, right? Docker, it seems so straightforward and easy for stateless applications. That's why I'm not going to demo a, a stateless application. The fun stuff here is for stateful applications. Stateless is easy. Stateful is where the real reward is, and it's where the real fun is. So what I've got here is, is uh, I've got... MySQL, uh, and I've brought that up as a project. And then what you can see is that I scaled it. I scaled it to three nodes. Um, so let's take a look at what that looks like. Now, I've got some cribs, uh, some notes cribbed here uh, so you can see what's going to happen in this demo. But let's take a quick look at what the, how this composition works. By the way, this is all I've done. There's nothing in the background that I've done to, to do more orchestration. All of this is just happening in Docker Compose. Um, and what you can see. First of all, you can see that my password right now is password. Um, you know, don't do this live. I, well, I mean, don't, don't run this in production uh, with that kind of password. Uh, but for demos, it's a whole lot easier. Um, and what you can see is that first host up became the primary, and then the next two hosts up became replicas, right? So uh, let's just check that replica status as well to see how that works. Um, and so what you can see here is, uh, the replica is working. MySQL 1, and, and so lots of people know how uh, Docker Compose works. This is awesome. So project name dot service name dot, dot uh, increment. So MySQL 1 is the primary. MySQL 2 is a replica. And what you can see is, as you look at that status, we're all caught up. But now let's do something here just to make sure that we've got data and that it's working. Uh, bam. So we're going to run this. Uh, it's going to be this word dictionary. Uh, later on, we're going to do some password cracking, uh, create some, uh, I've got some rainbow files. Alrighty. Again, a warning about using a password on the command line. But for demos, that's a whole lot easier. Um, now, let's just make sure 
that we have the data in the primary. Um, we're going to count on what that table was. We've got uh, about half a million rows in there, not a huge thing. Now let's check the uh, replica. So MySQL 2, um, bam, numbers match. So we've got this working. Uh, this is how we can run my, uh, basically any database, honestly, but this is implemented with MySQL uh, in Docker. But you're like, okay, you know, that's fun. You know, setting it up once is, is the easy part. Let's try something a little bit crazy. Let's knock over the primary. So um, here at this moment, we're killing that primary. Now, a lot of times when you operate things, uh, the, work, the work is really for the steady state, except for operationally, it's in a changing state constantly. So let's see what happens uh, when we do that. Now, the truth is, um, let's, look at, let's look at MySQL 2, see what shows up. Nothing yet. Maybe MySQL 3 showed up. Cross fingers, bam. So here's what happened. While we, weren't, while, while we were looking, in the brief instant uh, between the time that I knocked over the primary, those three MySQL hosts, we lost one, the primary, the two remaining hosts held an election and made the third instance the new primary, and then the second instance rejoined that primary. Now, the cool thing is all of this is happening uh, with no loss of uh, no loss of activity here. So let's go back and just check, confirm on MySQL 2 that it is adjoined to that primary. Uh, bam, uh, here we go. So um, you know what? This is now we get to go past the uh, past that. If this doesn't make you feel like Bruce Lee paying, playing ping pong with nunchucks, I don't know what is. Uh, I mean, this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is what, what we've wanted to achieve all along. And by the way, that is badass. If you disagree with me, let's talk after the show. Um, <laughs> uh, bam, look at that. Anyway, so um, this, is, this is what we've wanted to achieve all along, isn't it? I mean, we've wanted to have applications that operate this way. Basically, hands off, everything just automated. And this is one of the hairiest, most frustrating applications to run. I mean, it's clearly in the category of legacy applications, but we depend, a lot of us depend on it all the time. So how does this work? Uh, how did we make this work? And what I, wanna, what I wanna talk with you about is focusing on what happens inside the container in relation to the scheduler, right? And I'm gonna focus on the starting and the stopping of the container. Now. There are obviously a lot of approaches to orchestration. I'm focusing on this because I believe strongly in the separations of concerns, right? The scheduler's concerns are not related to the application. The scheduler is responsible for starting and stopping it, and the application is responsible for what it does in between. Now, we've only got those 20 minutes, so come find me afterwards and we'll talk about the different choices that we can make and how things go wrong. But I believe, and I think you'll, see, you'll agree as, as we go along, um, that when you separate those concerns, you can really simplify your operations, right? So starting the workload, stopping the workloads. Now, when we start MySQL, what do you think we should be doing? Uh, you know, actually, I kind of gave it away, so let's not, we'll skip the question in the interest of time. Um, you know, when we start MySQL, the first thing we want to do is ask, is there an existing MySQL cluster, right? Now, uh, if there is, I bet we want to join that MySQL cluster. Is that, is that what you'd think we want to do if we have an existing cluster? Okay, okay, I think so. Um, but if we don't have one, what, that, what this implementation did was it actually bootstrapped MySQL as the primary, right? And so as it started, there's a little bit of work that we're doing before we actually start the workload to operationalize that. Um, and so we look around, see if there's an existing MySQL cluster. We don't find one, so we bootstrap this as our own. Now, what we're also doing, by the way, behind the scenes, is we're backing up that database periodically. Uh, and so as we're going along, actually this implementation, every time the bin log rotates in MySQL, it backs up the database again. Um, and, uh, and as we stop MySQL, and that's what happened when I killed it, 
Now, that wasn't a graceful shutdown, actually. That was an ungraceful shutdown. So we didn't go through the process of cleanly deregistering. What happened is it just disappeared, as though the compute node or the, that it was on totally failed, right? But that was detected by the uh, replicas. Let's take a look at what the replica is doing. Now, at that start of the database, what happened was it looked around, um, and it saw that there was an existing MySQL cluster found it, joined it, um, joined it by downloading that backup, bootstrapping itself. What this means, by the way, is we're not dependent on like block storage and having that sort of thing. If you lose block storage, you're still okay. You can bring this up. You can scale easily. A lot of database implementation, database and container implementations depend on data map from the volume, but when you lose that volume, you're lost. This actually doesn't do any of that. Um, and so what it does is it gets that back up, bootstrap as a, bootstraps as a replica of the, uh, of the primary, joins the primary, syncs up to the current bin log position, boom, we're now live as a replica. But the whole time we're watching that cluster. We're making sure that we still have a primary because the moment we lose a primary, we hold that election as you saw, and we restart as, as uh, we hold that election for a primary and then go through the process of, of reorganizing the cluster, right? And in those situations where we have a clean shutdown of the instance, what we could do is actually pause, uh, evacuate the instance, drain the connections, and uh, have a nice, clean, easy shutdown, right? Now, uh, that's MySQL, and, and the way that we've built that, everything that we've just gone through, that focus on the application, that application-centric focus on orchestra for orchestration, we call that the autopilot pattern. Because that means we press a button and we're hands off, the thing just operates. Now, it operates according to rules that we define. We're still in control as the operators of this application. We've just programmed how we want it to behave. Normally, especially with MySQL and these legacy apps, those things are in the operator's manual. What we're doing is automating those operations uh, for this. It's not magic, it's automation, right? So we call that the autopilot pattern. Everything that we've gone through is open source. It's in GitHub. In fact, all of the automation that you saw is in 407 lines of really well-commented Python. So github.com slash autopilot pattern slash MySQL. Um, really well-commented Python. It's about 125, 150 real lines of, uh, of code. Um, and you know, we didn't just do that database. We've done a bunch of others. And in fact, can't fit all of those on screen, so let's make it a list. When I share this presentation later, all of these things are linked. Uh, but we've got a lot of different things. We've gone through this process with a lot of different apps. So you can have your message queue, NATs. You can have applications that nobody wants to operate, like Jenkins, right? How many of us use Jenkins? How many of us hate you hate operating Jenkins, all right? So what we've done here is we've actually operationalized Jenkins so that it's stateless, starts up, gets all of its jobs from, uh, from GitHub, executes those jobs. If you use, lose the Jenkins instance, um, you know what? It, that's okay, because you can start up a new one. If you create new jobs, well, there's a process you can run to back up those jobs to, uh, uh, to GitHub. Um, so all of these things, these different databases that you saw there, um, secrets management, all of that stuff there, uh, these building blocks are ready to use. Um, and the cool thing is those images, not just the code, that those actual images run everywhere. So I'm focusing on Docker Compose and Docker Swarm today, but you can run them in all of these different container environments. Right? And the reason that works is that we're focusing not on orchestration from the perspective of the scheduler and the cluster manager, we're actually focusing on orchestration from the perspective of the application. And that means we're portable across everywhere. Right? Um, now, you can imagine some people have tried to do this and you end up with a lot of different bash code. What we've done is we've taken the common things that we need to do, those, that is those events, put those into a Go application. We call it Container Pilot. It makes it super easy. That's open source. I would love to get into that, but let's race through that because this isn't just about the building blocks of our applications. You came here to see something real. So let's take a real application, something with some hair on it, something that's not built for uh, easy and stateless operations, and let's run with that uh, in the time that we have. You see me checking my watch because I want to make sure we get through everything. Um, this is going to be fun, even though it's an application that we all laugh at. I mean. Uh, it, it is what it is, but it's an application that a lot of people understand, uh, know the components of. Let's run that, all right? Now, this isn't just a demo that I'm doing up here. This is live. It's in, pro well, it's not really in production, but it's certainly available for you to go to. Uh, so let's actually click that right now. Bam. 
here that is live. Uh, and so you can see that. Let's make that bigger. Um, and in fact, I've just started that. You can see, uh, I mean, same processes with MySQL. Started Docker Compose up and then some scaling, uh, all of the scaling. And so we're actually, we are running at a production scale. All of this is running across different nodes. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it's ready to handle the load. So there aren't enough people in this room to crash it, but if you tried, that would be awesome. Um, so uh, let's keep going because all of this, as you know, was started with Docker Compose up. And I wanna focus a little bit on how Docker Compose works because Docker Compose gives you the ability to define services. And when you do Docker Compose up, it actually just basically does Docker run against the Docker API, which is kind of cool for each of those different things. So Docker Compose up and bam, we've got all these different things. As I scaled it, right, and this is the scale command I ran earlier, what that basically does is done a, do a whole lot of those Docker run commands. And so one of the things that I think it was why we love Docker Compose is how this makes it super easy to be consistent in, we, in the way we run Docker commands, right? You define it, then you can just, you know, Docker run this and get at it basically with a macro or just specify the, uh, what I mean is to specify the service name. Um, and so that's cool. But, uh, uh, and, we get, and we get to this and we got, uh, so a lot of different containers here. Um, how many people know, however, that you can do a rolling update with Docker Compose? One, maybe, okay, so a handful of people. How many people actually do that in production? <laughs> It's a rare number of people. Um, this is super cool. And you know what we're gonna do? Um, we're actually gonna do this. Uh, we're gonna do this against MySQL, right? So, bam, we're doing this thing. What, what it's, it's actually executing, um, and it occurs to me, I don't have a slide on that one. What it's actually doing is it's actually stopping each of those containers, right? Now, if we go, uh, here it is, it's starting with uh, MySQL 5. If we go back to this, um, we're actually gonna have this running constantly the whole damn time. But, you know what? As awesome as that is, um, it's, uh, it, it, uh, for me, it gives me something that I can tell my family about what I'm doing, right? So it, it gives you this one finger, basically, way to start stuff, scale it easily, perhaps worldwide, if that's your thing. Um, and so now I can explain to my family that I'm building Skynet. That makes, it super, that makes me super happy. Um, hopefully that makes you happy. Um, but uh, that, that's, that's what this kind of automation of that application can do. Now, the thing I want to ask, though, is where does that run into problems? Well, um, how many people have run out of, uh, those who are in production with Swarm and Compose, I mean, you run out of, you, you can run out of cluster, right? And then you have to add more, you know, it's like running a ground. Um, so you have to add more cluster. Uh, and that can be really frustrating because sometimes bringing up that cluster means, uh, can, can be slower, mean a lot of work, um, and knowing, having that coordination between your cluster size and your, and your, uh, and, and this number of containers you have, that's extra operational concern that you have, especially if you're scaling down. You know, I ask a lot of people about how do they scale, uh, and they tell me, don't worry, uh, you know, our scale is relatively good, we scale up around the holidays, uh, and a couple of other days, uh, and then we're good. Um, I'm like, well, wait a minute, you realize that if we look at your stats, you're probably paying 4X during the middle of, you know, during, during the middle of the night than you need. And I'm like, yeah, that's a, you know, it's too hard to do this. Well, the reason it's too hard is that we, that we have, we're approaching it the wrong way. We're approaching it with this idea that we need a cluster. And I wanna share a different idea. Can we go clusterless? I think we can. Um, and, uh, and you know, of course we need to go back to Bruce Lee and, and think about it, uh, but we can go clusterless. Now, I want you to, to be aware, I'm not talking about serverless, right? Because serverless is full of servers. Um, and, uh, and there really are a whole lot of operators trying to make no ops possible. Um, what I'm talking about is going clusterless. Um, and the way to do this is, and this might sound a little bit familiar if you were here at the earlier thing, the way to do this is actually to virtualize the Docker API endpoint for the entire data center, right? And so the way this works is that every Docker run is placing that container on its own somewhere in bare metal on that data center. Of course, you have to have a secure data center. Come talk to me later and we'll talk about how that works. Um, and when you do a whole bunch of Docker run or Docker compose scale, that places that around there. No VMs 
you're running at data center scale. It's placing it around the data center. So everything I showed earlier, it actually wasn't running in Docker Swarm. It was actually running in this context. So as I scaled, it was doing that across the data center, each one in on its own node. Um, and that means we can do some crazy stuff like this, uh, which I'm going to leave, leave you with. So we're going to do this clusterless scaling and boom, see how that works, uh, and now we'll just run with it. Um, and if that doesn't make you feel like you're hacking the Gibson, I don't know what does. Um, and yes, that means I have to go back to a 20-year-old movie uh, to demonstrate it. Um, I want to thank you for your time uh, and invite you to, uh, to scale stuff with me. Thank you, um, and have a great afternoon.